Hey everybody, this is Dominic D'Angelo, WrestleZone.com. Today's date is January 28th, 2021. The year has finally turned and I'm happy to have with me here today, Mike Kyoto. Uh, thank you for joining me, Mike. It's a real pleasure to speak with you for the first time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dominic. Appreciate it, man. How yeah. are you doing? Good, good. Um, so you're here courtesy of ad-free shows, obviously, but um, you, got, you got a Royal Rumble watch along coming up, don't you? Yeah, uh, coming up exactly. Saturday with Paul Bromwell. So looking forward to it. Uh, Royal, uh, it's a Royal Rumble match, a title match between Brock, Seth, Seth Rollins, and John Cena. Oh, nice. So, uh, you know, it's a title match there. We're going to go do the watch along or second watch along on Ed Free Shows and should be fun. Looking forward to it. How do you like doing the watch along stuff? Is that pretty kind of neat? Is like giving that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, first years. time ever, first time ever I did one, you know, like uh, December 12th. Yeah. And uh, it went off pretty good. I mean, it felt great. You know, like fans ask intelligent questions respectful questions, which I appreciate. And, um, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, it's the first time I ever did it. Looking forward to many more. There's many more matches we can do. I probably could do this for three years straight. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. Without a doubt. Cause you've been there since 1980. You've been yeah, in wrestling yeah. since 1989. So you're yeah, good to yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah referee and I started in 89, my debut on TV. Yeah. But, uh, it started with the company like 1985. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. And yeah, I did doing a little bit of the research and stuff and you start off you were you neighbors with uh joey morella and gorilla monsoon was that it? yeah yeah I lived yeah. five minutes away from it willingboro new jersey yeah yes how sir. about that how, so that's how'd you get to meet them essentially how'd that all start off for you well joey and uh his, his sister actually we played baseball together mm -hmm. in the same township area and everything we hung out and we i knew i knew valerie morella's sister she went to the same school i did joey went to holy cross i went to willingboro township and uh, so he went to a private school, but we hung out, became the best of friends. And, uh, and that's where, I, I mean, I actually used to work wrestling for Gorilla Monsoon when he used to own a, a wrestling uh, territory. Oh. And he, and he used to work for Vince Sr. That was before Vince owned everything. So uh, he used to work with Vince Sr. And he had his own little territory in Philadelphia, Maryland, the Jersey Shore and all that. And uh, the Pennsylvania area. And so I used to do ring crew and stuff when I was like 15, 16 years old. No way. Oh, so, yes. It was good times, man. It made some good money, man. Making like 500 bucks a night when I was 15. That, dude, that's old. for that's Yeah. Holy shit. That's I mean, nice. you had to hustle. You know, you did the ring, the robes, the timekeeping, the, the music. Then you sold programs before, you know, before the show. You show them, sell them intermission. And then you did the blowout after the show. And then I got back down, tearing down the ring and. It was good, but it was it was good money, good hustling. You know, Absolutely. You hustling. Absolutely. Now, were you a wrestling fan too, just starting off, like before you even uh, got associated with No, wrestling? I mean, I wasn't, I mean, wrestling always intrigued me. Like I was always intrigued by wrestling. You know, it was like wrestlers, of course, like Andre the Giant when I first met him and Hulk Hogan and this one and Big John Studd and, you know, and just a bunch of guys just didn't, I was like, wow. Like I was more of a baseball fan, sports fan. I played baseball for a long time period of time too so more sports and then uh wrestling i kind of just got intrigued but with it when i was working for with joey and for gorilla monsoon and stuff and um just kept going with it that was it so like when you started when you, so what was your first official match that you did for uh i would say it was probably 1987 86 87 uh-huh because i i mean i was doing ring crew and stuff like that and then the uh, Chief Jay Strombo made me a referee. So he wanted me to be a referee. He wanted Joey teach me the ropes. Yeah. And so forth. And uh, they were tired of like the commission referees. Mm -hmm. So they were really tired of the New York State Commission, which they were trying to weed out the commission in Pennsylvania and New York. So um, he wanted me to be a referee. So I, so I started about in 87, but you didn't go right up to TV there. You had to pay some dues. You had to learn what you were doing. Right. Which I was still green, you know, when I was on TV, probably in 1989, <laughs> made, made my debut. Yeah. But uh, it was probably about 88, 89, I made my TV debut. And then, um, you know, just took off from there. So it was great, you know. How'd you take doing it in front of like, you know, a big audience and everything like that? Was it kind of like, was, was there nerves there at all for you? Or was it mostly big like, time. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you, you got to think you're doing live events for a couple of years and, you're doing small venues too. We were doing like high schools and and um, elementary schools, like auditoriums and stuff like that. And of course, you did the big shows like Philadelphia Spectrum or Madison Square Garden. 
which was phenomenal when you got to those shows. Point yeah. Three nights <laughs> there. Um, I'd probably say like uh, my first ever, um, the biggest one was 82,000, like 90, 92 mm-hmm. Wembley Stadium. Oh, yeah. So that was probably my hugest crowd that I, I performed in, you know, in a match. So like I worked a uh, six man tag. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, that yeah. was SummerSlam 92? 92 Webley Stadium. That was with uh, Bret Hart. Yeah. Davy Boy. Davy Boy. Okay. Yeah, actually, was... Joey, actually, Joey did that match. That's right. Yeah, that's so, right. I remember. Yeah, that, that crowd was about 82,000 people, man. That was phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> Taker's entrance was huge that night. It was just, what a big show. Really, <laughs> that, that really took off in Europe after that show, I think. You know, we took off in Europe after that. That was, now, that was an impact. Is there a particular spot, like... Um, outside of the united states that you really just relish like working in essentially yeah man i'd probably have to say there's a ton of them and canada has definitely been one of them you know canada's just got such a respect for wrestling and all the great talent that's come out of canada My over gosh, the years yeah. you know talking to edge and christian and Bret hit dead man hard owen and just guys you could just name a list of them you know uh i'd say canada uh i want to say like Germany was probably one of them when we first did German Germany tours. Yeah. It was so loud. And the, the, those crowds were so loud. I mean, I remember the ring announcer, Tony Timmel used to walk out and the place just went nuts. And we were like, <laughs> Tony didn't even know what to do. He was like, I don't even know how to react to the crowd. You know, like it was just like, and I remember like somebody would take a hit toss or just a shoulder tackle and the place would go nuts. It was like, <laughs> Oh my God, there's, there's no getting these people. We already got them. Right. <laughs> you know, and I mean, Germany used to be one of the loudest crowds. Ireland's great. Um, there's so many different countries in their own different ways. Japan was phenomenal when I worked there, but they were a different, respectful crowd. Right. It's they clapped a, a lot at that time. They didn't cheer. You know, they, ooh, ah, and then they clapped for a respectful move for, for respect and show that they liked it or appreciated that or. Yeah. But, um, you know, just working in different countries and different things. And every country had its own different ways of showing their love for wrestling. It's such unique. Yeah. Going to and like the culture and everything like that, that comes into play. I, I got to listen to some of the, the mailbag episodes that you've been doing on ad free shows. And right. uh, you mentioned and talked about how cool like Montreal was and everything. Oh, yeah. like that, and just such yeah. a neat neat dynamic. Like in Canada, you're right. There's such respectful fans and they play into like what, like the the heels and the baby faces whoever it may oh, be yeah. it's just I, it's got to be such a cool experience even if you're- no it is i mean i've been over at least almost like 60 different countries you know and wow. a lot of countries over and over and over i mean italy was great when we were first going there and you know and, and certain times when you ran a country too much you kind of killed it a little bit you know they like yeah. kill it you know <laughs> but when we first got to these countries a lot of these different countries man they were australia like I remember we did that, like that Melbourne tour, mm-hmm. you know, that was, that was phenomenal, you know, like the Australia crowd and stuff like that. So it just, uh, each different you know country has these different love and respect, like I said, for, for wrestling. 100%. It's it's such a neat, yeah. I mean, wrestling such an engaging and it connects with everybody in so many ways. So it's, it's neat to see that come across in different countries. Um, yeah. And especially Europe. I mean, Europe is just phenomenal. I mean, they, they get those chants going and, yep. and everything and just, you know, then they'll let you, they'll let you know, you know, they'll give you shit if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so it's, it's pretty neat. Cause uh, what you also mentioned on that episode I was listening to is that um, Pat Patterson would give you credit because like you wouldn't stand out, like you wouldn't. Uh, that, you absolutely that right. Kind of and like that's speaks to being a good referee too. He says in a lot of ways. That's and, true. Uh, yeah. Pat Patterson used to always just tell me. I used to come back. Pat, did you see that match? He'd be <laughs> like, "Oh, were you in it?" And I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "Unbelievable, fantastic <laughs> match. The place went bananas. The place is nuts." And then he go like, "You were in that match?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh, good. That means you did your job." You're right. <laughs> he goes, "Fantastic. That's right." When the referees, you know, when you don't notice the referee. The referee's doing his job. He always, and you know, Gorilla Monsoon used to say the same thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of old school, like Chief J and Jack Lanza, Rene Goulet, like they used to always say, like, because if you did things in a ring, even in a live event, I'd come back and Chief J would go, Are, are you campaigning for yourself there, Donovan? 
what's, what's exactly? You know, yeah, you campaigning for yourself or are you selling tickets for yourself now? You sell tickets? No, sir. <laughs> Why are you doing that shit? You know, like, in the ring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, you know? Uh, I thought too, um, and that's that's the neat thing is because like when uh, I got pitched the interview and stuff like that, I'm like, man, what which ones did Mike referee? Yeah. <laughs> and so, and then looking back and seeing it, like just the list that you have is is amazing. And like, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, it's, it's quite a list. Yeah. I got I got to figure out how many matches I've actually done in my career, but you need a statistician. That's what you got. You got. I, know, I know it's over ten thousand, anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand at least. Holy so, smokes. I mean, I'm talking yeah. between live events and TVs and sure, yeah. So, forth. so everything to that ex- aspect. What's um, if is there a certain match that maybe kind of flies under the radar uh, to maybe fans, but is there one that really stands out for you that you're kind of really proud of that you've done over the course of your career? Yeah, I mean, there's there's actually a ton of them, and I can't I could take imagine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not taking any away from Undertaker, Triple H, and you know. Bret Hart's and and all these other fab, unbelievable talent throughout the years. Um, I mean, you know, like, there's a ton of them. There's Shawn Michaels and Stone Cold at WrestleMania with Mike Tyson's The Enforcer yeah. on the outside. Um, uh, there's Rock and Hogan. Yep. It's probably on my top list. I mean, even though it wasn't such a technical match, a technical wrestling match, an high-flying match, it was just the, the way the crowd responded to Hogan and the rock that night in Toronto and that, that sky dome was just, just, that always just sticks in my head, you know I mean? And, uh, you know, that match there, and there's a ton of matches that really stick out strong. You know, yeah. I, I probably have to put rock and Hogan. On the top. Rock and Hogan's your number one there. huh? I mean, it was just, it was just what a, I, I kind of just, that's, I marked out for that match tremendously. You know, Cause you had, you know, the icon of where I was growing up for, for many years, Hulk Hogan. Yeah. And then facing, you know, the guy that was passing the torch to the rock, basically. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, rock will say, yeah, like, okay, he passed the torch to me, but then he went off to Hollywood after that. Not too long. Yeah. It was uh, <laughs> not too long after. <laughs> Hightailed it. <laughs> Can I go to Hollywood with you, rock. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but um, up a couple yeah, he took the movies. torch and took it right to Hollywood. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, something that I was kind of curious. Oh, let's talk about this first. Um, you also refereed uh, the WrestleMania 31 match, right? Where Seth Rollins cashed in. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So what did you know? Did you know about him cashing in at all? Or what was the, the outgoing of that? How much did yeah. you know going into that? No, I, I knew. You. I, yeah. I didn't know towards the, the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, they were kind of keeping everything kayfabe. But if you want things to go right, you better tell the referee what you're doing. Right? <laughs> you can't <laughs> I can make adjustments. Ball. You can make adjustments anytime, you know, call it in the ring or do whatever, mm-hmm. you know, so, but, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I knew, you know, and I was very happy for Seth Rollins, you know, I mean, Seth Rollins, an unbelievable talent, you know, when he first came in, that kid's got more moves than, than, you know, than anything. I mean, every week I would see him pull out with new moves. He's just so acrobatic, and so talented in that ring, you know. Even that that mania, that match he had with Thornton, like that curb stomp he did where it was like that RKO to a curb, like the curb stomp to an RKO. Transition into that, yeah. That was the just way, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, the way he transitioned to that it was good. That was really cool. Yeah. Um, wow. But he's he's phenomenal talent. I, you know, he's going to be around for quite a bit. He's going to be he's going to be around for quite some time, that kid. Absolutely, absolutely. I, now, I wish him the best of luck the rest of his career. Is there a particular talent? Maybe it doesn't have to be current either, but just over the course of your career, that like uh, maybe like whether it's from a politics standpoint or anything else, it just didn't pan out. But you saw so much potential, and maybe from just the referee perspective of things. On what? Say, I'm sorry. So is there? A, yeah, is there a particular talent that maybe um, had so much more potential that maybe you, you saw potential in as as a talent that could had a higher ceiling than maybe what? Uh, happened for ultimately in his career or anybody is there, or a certain yeah, time just, um, I'd have to say the the guy that never got pushed right would probably I'd have to say Dolph Ziggler yeah you know? and uh, Daniel Bryan even went through a little you know phase there for a while we couldn't win a pay-per-view couldn't win anything for quite a while you know yeah it's, it's something like uh, you know the confrontation I remember he he got in with Triple H at the gorilla position I did Randy Orton's match and Daniel Bryan's and um this was moving forward. I think mm-hmm. I believe it was about 2013. And 
Daniel Bryan got hurt and, um, and they, they made me call the match. So, and I kept asking Daniel, oh, you okay? You know, I said, Daniel, you, know, you okay, brother? You okay? Yeah. I'm good, cute. I can, I can finish. I can finish. I can, I can, you know, I said, you sure? I said, he's all right, but they canceled the match. And, you know, it came from up in Gorilla. And I remember he stormed out so hot. And that's even, then that's even leading into 2015, where we're going to do the watch long match in Philadelphia mm -hmm. with the title match. But he had lost that Royal Rumble match again, like another pay-per-view. I believe he lost that Royal Rumble match too again. And yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were like, they were making him do the job so much, Daniel, Brian at that time. It was like the people had no, they got behind him so strong. I've never seen it like, you know, they, they really built it up and they got behind him strong, you know. I tell you what, there's no more flaunt of the talent, I think, right now than Daniel Bryan because he just, like, he he does, like, if he gets, like, if he doesn't get pushed properly or anything like that, the, he's just such a connecting person, like, in a that in an organic human being that it's, like, you're so able to connect with them so easy. Yeah, I mean, a hell of a shoot fighter, too, so. <laughs> yeah, that, too. Oh, yeah, he's, he's badass. Don't judge a book by its cover there, boy. Absolutely and, not. Uh, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, with going with that, you know, I'd say Dolph Ziggler was one of the, uh, you know, I, I believe he's getting somewhat pushed now, but there was so many years that that kid had so much good talent. Oh my God. And, you know, and I've seen a lot of other talent that had a lot of potential and just never made it, you know, I mean, just didn't get through the uh, political standpoint that the company. Through the whole process of it. Yeah, no, Dolph's a great one. Cause I even think Survivor Series, uh, I can't remember what year it was. I want to say 2015 or 2014. Sting, when Sting was there, and I remember he was the highlight. Like, Dolph was the lone survivor and won it all. And, like, I was like, that, this is the chance. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they, they kept giving it to Dolph and taking it right back. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's right back. so frustrating. <laughs> so, and, you know, it's it's hard. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say The Miz got a great opportunity. And you didn't think he, he thought he was going to get left back. But then he just kind of just boosted himself right back to the top, you know? Right. And that's good. He was good talent. He can cut a stick, he can cut a promo on a stick, like unbelievable, Miz, you know? And now he's doing, he's doing a lot of Hollywood stuff himself too. Yeah, right. Making himself more marketable and available and stuff. That's, that's yeah. what you got to do, man. Yeah, but that's um, that question, I'd probably have to say Dolph Ziggler got the worst. Answer. That's a great answer. Yeah, Other that's politics, a great answer. You know? Yeah. Um, so Bill brought this one to my attention, our editor, uh, Bill, he, uh, mentioned that, and I totally forgot about this. You were in a tag match with the rock Jericho oh, yeah. in Mobile, <laughs> Alabama yeah. against Nick Patrick and the Dudley boys. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. First match ever. I'm in yeah. there with the rock and Chris Jericho, like two pros, you know, yeah, two old schools and the Dudley boys as well, you know, mm -hmm. and, Nick Patrick, and it was it was a great time. Uh, I remember they told me you're in a match today. Where I said, "What? <laughs> yeah, you're 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 wrestling today." I said, "I'm wrestling." I said, "I said, and what? And your referee shirt, and your referee gear." So I said, "Oh my god!" You know, so I must have I had to try that that the people's elbow probably like about ten times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean. Remember, uh, you know, the Dudley boys, I remember Bubba coming up to me and says, when I give you this clothesline, I you better sell that son of a gun all the way. I must have, since that clothesline, I took that bump. I must have been holding my shoulder all the way through the end of the match. Yeah, you know and how to come back. He's like, Kyoto, man, you oversold that too much. I'm like, what? I'm like, I sold it all the way to the back. I was registering it. I did my job. <laughs> You oversold. I said, oh, now you're going to tell me I oversold. Jeez, what He's do you like, want yeah, but I'm not hot at you for that. I'd rather be hot at you for overselling than yeah. underselling. Than That's underselling, 100%. <laughs> but that, that was a lot of fun. That was yeah. a lot of fun. I'll never forget that. That was awesome. Yeah, dude. Um, as far as, uh, this is something else I wanted to ask was, um, pet peeves. Do you have any like pet peeves when it comes to like being in the ring and refereeing a match, whether it's like with the wrestlers or just how a style is gone? Is there anything that really stands out to you? Like, Oh man, I wish, you know, don't kind of do that when I'm refing a match or anything. Is there anything? Well, like yeah. I mean, you don't want to, you know, because especially with TV, mm -hmm. you don't want to get buried. Yeah. I do have like, there's a lot of pet peeves a referee should have. Yeah. Like myself. I mean, you know, you didn't want to get buried. If the guys are going to be out too long, you got to make sure whether you talk to them, whether you, when you went over a match with one of the boys, whether it's singles or a tag, yeah, you got to like a referee has to protect himself a lot too. 
You just can't expect all the talent to protect the referee. The ref, referee has to protect himself, keep himself busy, know where to be, know what to do. And when these guys tell you about these, you know, they go over their matches, that, that's when a referee should be able to say, hey, you know, I'm not in business for myself. I'm not in this, but, you know, this is the way Vince wants it, you know. Yeah. And uh, this is the way we're going with this. And, you know, you got to get in before the count of 10. If you don't, I got to count you out. Yeah. You know, there's so many times I'm going through the rope. Hey, get the F in here. Get in here. Yeah, like, you're killing me. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on eight for 10 seconds. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, uh, but I mean, you know, the most talent work with you, especially all the pros do, mm-hmm. you know, but a lot of guys get caught up in a moment. And you just got to, you know, you got to make sure a referee doesn't have his back turned for five seconds or eight seconds. It seems so long when a referee, it should be like a one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, ref turns back right away. You know? Got to seem seamless, yeah. There's no heat. There's no heels. Yeah. You know, there's no, you know, you got to have heat in a match. You got to just, you got to establish your heel and your baby face. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so as long as the heat's done right and it's done behind her, like more of I always said, I don't mind you do it. Like I'd rather you outsmart me than just completely bury me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? During a match. So if you outsmart me, it makes it look, you know, you, Oh, the heels are just out slicking my kill the referee. You know, they're look how smart they are. Look how slick they are. You know, yeah, that makes it adds to their credibility. Yeah. Right. As a, right. Yeah, as a healer. You know, it's, yeah. it's many different ways. You know, as soon as you, it's, you throw somebody off the ropes and a heel has to do something on the outside with a tag team match. The other guy's got to take you or the baby face has got to take you. Right. You know, and the baby face got to bitch about something, you know, Hey, hey, he's coming out of his corner. So you go to the baby face and the heels do their thing real quick. And then the baby face tries to get in and you're stopping him a couple seconds. Then you're back over there. Hey, what's going on? You got to keep busy as a referee. Cause if you know, you know, you're going to look stupid. Yeah. Right. (laughs) You are. Is there, um, so yeah, like say example, like when there comes those instances where it's like, you got to make a three count and the ref i mean the the wrestler doesn't get their shoulder up how do you go about that process i mean is it just like count it out i usually talk to a lot of the talent so when i'm counting and if i especially if it's talent i haven't worked with for a long time Mm -hmm. or somebody had just come in and i haven't worked with him ever you know i'll tell him hey i'll tell you to kick you know coming down and like because all referees count different yeah we all have certain heights different on our counts and our arms and stuff like that so you know some some referees count this way. Some referees, you know, if you could tell, everybody's got somewhat of a different count. Sure, so, yeah. I mean, and you got to be on the same page with the guy that's getting pinned. A lot of guys like to, you know, when the crowd's loud and they like to close their eyes when they're laying there for a false count, I tell them, look at me. Yo, look at me. I'll go down. Look at me. Open your eyes, you know, because you got to be on the same page. And if they can't hear you, they can't hear the count if the crowd is so loud at that point, then they can at least see you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it, it's all goes to the storytelling aspect, what you ultimately want at the end of the goal, you know? Oh, yeah. Be on that same page. Be on that same and page. I mean, I, there's even times where I get down and get your shoulder down, get your shoulder down before I even start to count. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll drop their shoulder or something like that. So, because you don't want to sit there and not tell them that. Yeah. And the shoulder's literally up, and I'm counting with the shoulders with up. The shoulder it's up. It's, yeah. You know? So, I mean, that's why you got the referee's got to communicate with the talent just as much as the talent's got to commu- communicate with the referees. So. And it adds to your point too, is like, just uh, there's so much that you got to factor into play. Like, like if the ref has credibility, then those wrestlers have credibility because it's, it's you're, you're going back and forth and you have to, yeah, find the balance of the baby face and the heel in it. And you're part of the story. Like right. if you're not even, a, if, if the fans can't, don't even notice you though, but you're still part of the story. It's, it's, it's such, plays such a huge part in the sports-like aspect of it. Well, you're part of the story when a referee screws up, that's when you really become a part of the story. All right, that's true. You don't do something wrong. These people, these smart fans, they, they see what's going on. They'll, they'll start <laughs> booing on you in a heartbeat. Yeah. And I mean, these days they even still say, you screwed up or you mm-hmm. effed up. You yep. effed up. You know, it's like... <laughs> shit <laughs> damn it but um yeah it's important to communicate with the talent you know as a referee so i mean there's so many things that people don't see as like i've said i've gone you know you they're not focused on the referees so you may not see what i'm saying mm-hmm. to the talent going down for a count or a kick out because you're not so focused on there you're focused on the pinfall yeah 
but you know, it's, it's great. That's, I, that's what I loved about this sport, you know, because you can communicate as you're, you're counting, you're working with each other. And that's what's, that's what, you know, when you talk, when you, you're talking in the ring, that's the best, you know, yeah, yeah. Talking, it, talking it out in the ring, call it in the ring, you know, no, it's, it's got to add something to it for sure. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, cause there's a lot of things when the wrestlers, they even have their legs under the rope and you want to get a good false finish out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and you got, Hey, get your leg back in before you start to count, you know, yeah. there's so many different scenarios that you have to go over with talent, with, with pinfalls and false finishes and stuff like that. And oh. when you know, when you know, you have that crowd off your, off their feet on a one, two kick out, not today. And you're going home into the finish. And you got this crowd up and down, up and down. You know, then you know the referee's doing. You feel like you know the rhythm's going too, up. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great to be a part of the, you know, the third man in the ring doing that. You know, I yeah. I mean, it just has to be like not only did you get the obviously like a front row seat, of basically, but you're just there. You're in, you're in, in the element of it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, the heat of it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's usually it's it's the crowd. Like you know, when you get in there, you kind of block out the crowd. You, yeah. you register them, you do this, but then you'll, you'll hear them pop. You'll hear them this or on false finishes or on entrances and this, but when there's a big match and it's going in there, you kind of, I, I kind of used to just almost didn't even know the crowd was there at sometimes, you know? Yeah. I bet not. I really bet so not. Focused on what you're doing, you know, and you got, you're talking to the talent, you're talking to them in the ring, you're trying to do your job. You're getting it from gorilla, like every which way. Yeah. You know? but it's not well, easy in there how about is there a particular wrestler that was the most like easiest to work with is there somebody that really stands out that you're like oh man this guy he just he's so smooth to work with he's ne- never causes any problems anything like that is there anybody yeah, no i mean i gotta say a lot of talent you know there's, there's a lot of talent i mean there's there there were a lot of wrestlers back in the day too and you know like there's randy orton and all that just smooth and methodical type of way of working and um there's a I mean a lot of talent in there it was just great to work with you know it's just I can really you know it's like Shawn Michaels um he was very like particular on who his ref was and his counts and his false finishes and Razor mm-hmm. Ramon was and a lot of guys but those are guys that cared and there's a lot of guys that, I'm not saying nobody cared every all the talent yeah. cares about how the match is going to go but that are very very particular on where the ref is and what the ref is to do and stuff like that. So, and that's good because it makes it work. It does it really. Does. All right. Hey, I'm going to close out with this. So All right. before we did, before we started recording here, you said, you told me you're a Pittsburgh sports fan. Yeah, <laughs> How did that really come is. to be? And uh, we'll talk a little bit just about well, some of the teams. Real quick. Yeah. Growing up in South Jersey, uh, you know, <laughs> born in North Jersey, grew up in South Jersey. Uh, my grandfather was uh, my uncle Stash and my grandfather and everything. And uh, they were a Steeler fan, used Steelers in the 60s and 70s. Yes, and in the 70s, they got really big, you know, with Bradshaw coming around. And I became a Steeler fan because living in South Jersey, you had the option to be an Eagles fan or you had an option to be a giant jet fan, stuff yes. like that. And um, I was kind of a Mets fan and a Pirate fan when I grew up, you know, and just uh, became – Pittsburgh all the way to Penguins and everything. So, but I still like the Flyers. I still like to see the Eagles, you know, and stuff like that. But my heart's in Pittsburgh. Oh, you can't. For, for sports. It's that, have you been to PNC Park before? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What an like, experience. It's a beautiful park. The it is. Always very questionable, nice. but. <laughs> yes. No, it's a very nice park. Yeah. But. Holy smokes. Any favorite players that stand out to you? Who, who Who's big notes for you, Pittsburgh-wise, anybody? Pittsburgh? Yeah. Uh, I mean, back in my day, it was Terry Bradshaw, of course, Lynn Swan, yep. John Starworth, me, Joe Green, L.C. Greenwood, uh, Ernie Holmes on the defense. You had Mel Blunt. You had Jack Lambert, which was a very inspiration guy. And Jack Ham, linebackers. Yep. Um, Mike Wagner. I mean, I remember all those guys and Donnie Shell and throughout the course of the years, you know, uh, the player really stands out to me in mind anymore. Now he's, he's ready to take it to the Super Bowl is Tom Brady. I mean, this guy, and I'm, I'm a Steeler fan all his, you know, of course, all his years. Finally, he goes to the NFC. Now I have to worry, I don't have to worry about the Steelers facing 
Yeah. The New England Patriots and Tom Brady in the AFC Championship or playoffs. Yeah. And the Steelers get knocked out by the Browns the first round. What the hell happened? And then Tom Brady's in the Super Bowl again. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> that guy, he just comes to play every week, man. He I, comes you know, to play. Mike, I'm a Jets fan. So, well, gotcha. <laughs> so I, but I love Tom Brady. I just love what I, he's done. And he's, he's a grinder, dude. That's what you want. Me too, man. I do. I mean, he can't. You know, how can you want to stop? Like, how do you stop hating to win? Right. You know, like, if you were a Brady fan and you had tickets to go see Tom Brady in New England, you won almost every home game. Yeah. You got your money's worth. Yeah. And then you're in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl every other year or so. Oh, my God. So, it's- I mean, you know, uh, it was great. We had Tom, we had Tampa Bay tickets to, the, to um, the Bucks tickets. We got, when we first moved there, I bought Buccaneers uh, tickets. Season Did tickets you? For me and my wife. And I said, babe, we're going to get to see Drew Brees coming to town before he retires. We're going to see Aaron Rodgers. We're going to see this one. Plus, we get to see Tom Brady. I said, babe, the Super Bowl's in Tampa. So we get the tickets, and they call us right before the season and said, since you're so new on the list, uh-huh. we can't. you're not going to be able to see any games this year. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And, said, and, the, and the stipulation was we were – if. If Tampa Bay Buccaneers didn't make the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. right, we were in a 25% raffle to get tickets for the Super yeah. Bowl. If the Bucs did make the Super Bowl, we were in a 75% raffle to get the Super Bowl tickets. That what? cost. Yeah. So I was like, oh, shit, that's great chances. You know, with Tom Brady. Yeah. And look where we're sitting now. Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. I would have been going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to go. I'm going to go on the outside and hang out. Check Dude, it why out. Why the hell bit. not, huh? We'll be close by there. Maybe go somewhere to see the game or something like that. So it's going to be a crazy experience. Like the first ever team, like first ever team hosting the Super Bowl. What? And that's what they, I think that's why that stipulation was there. Oh, if the Bucks make it, you're in a 75% raffle. If they don't make it, you're in a 25% raffle. Like, I'm like, yeah, okay. Like whatever home team's ever been in the Super Bowl. Right. Yeah. So that's going to be impossible, you know? Of course, Tom Brady makes the impossibles into he's the possibles. It. 43 you know? years old, man, and he's doing this shit. It's crazy. Right? Yeah. 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 Good luck to Tom Brady. I like I like Patrick. Love Patrick Mahomes. Oh, me too. Yeah. But this is gonna be this is where I this is where I just stand behind old school. So I mean, I want to see old school get his W, get yep. out, get out strong. You know, Patrick Mahomes, he's a great quarterback, fantastic, one of the best I've ever seen, too. But his time's coming. You know, yeah, he'll get he's got but, he's got plenty of time to do all this stuff, you know. Yeah, but I, I kind of do. And I, I, I know Rick Burkholder, he's a trainer for uh, the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. I've known him for 20 some years oh, since wow. he's been, he, he used to work for Pittsburgh Steelers as a trainer. Oh, no but way. he's been with Andy Reid for about 20 years now since Philadelphia and all that. Yeah, his name is Rick Burkholder, a great friend of mine. So if Kansas City wins it, I'm happy to, for that. right. It's, yeah, it's going to be a great game, I think, either way. I mean, it's, I think, historic, you know, just the, the two greatest going at it right now, like the yeah. greatest currently and greatest of all time. I think it just writes its headline for itself, obviously. So, Oh, big time, big time. I think it's going to be a nice little shootout there, you know, so we'll see. I'm pumped, man. I'm pumped. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, anything right, else? Don? Yeah, you want to plug or anything going on you got otherwise? Uh, I got some shirts of pro tees, rest, pro wrestling tees and stuff, you know. No new new stuff out yet though. Working on it now, so and that's in it. I got the uh, the podcast for ad free shows with uh, Watch Along on Saturday, it's and that true. that'll be at 12, uh, 12 Eastern time. Awesome, so looking man. forward forward to doing that with Paul Bromwell, and he's been helping me and coaching me through these video chats and all this other stuff and the zooms and helping me out. So this is all kind of new to me. It's a, it's got to be a fun and rewarding experience when you like just the reflecting back and kind of just. Uh, yeah, it's been great, man. To tell my stories and to share some of the stories, of course, the 35 years of traveling, I got quite a few of them. So Heck we'll yeah, man. it's great. And I appreciate them giving me the opportunity, just like you tell them some of my stories. Absolutely. Appreciate no, that. thanks for get, allowing me the opportunity too, man. Thank you got you. Dom. So. All right. Well, thank you for everything. All right. Thanks guys. We'll talk to you later.